In a world overwhelmed by headlines and chaos, Kingdom Truth Media brings clarity through a biblical supernatural perspective. We go beyond the news seeking truth grounded in scripture, educating, informing, and inspiring with insight that transcends time. Subscribe and see the world in truth with Kingdom Truth Media. Welcome to Kingdom Truth Media. I'm your host, Dr. Jonathan Welton, and today we're going to talk about how truth divides, then unites. I was reading the other day on Facebook a post written by a missionary that uh, was talking about how after this election, which has been so divisive and people are so politically divided, that after this whole thing, we're all going to need to find our way back to unity. Now, I personally am calling BS on that because I believe what we've actually seen is a greater unity around truth than I've seen in my entire lifetime. I do not believe that we are an extremely divided country. That's actually something that is a talking point of the leftist mainstream media. The leftist mainstream media is talking about how dangerous the mega extremists are how uh, their their rhetoric and their their fire and they're going to cause all these riots you know like the riots that we saw back in 2020 that burned down cities all around the country oh wait that wasn't us you know like like the fiery riots that burned down washington dc on january 6 huh wait no that was when the capitol police literally opened the doors and sweet old grannies walked into the Capitol and respectfully walked between the velvet ropes. Huh. See, I, I think we've bought into some lies. We've bought into some lies around how uh, divided we are when the truth of the matter is actually we have unified around truth. And that's what's terrifying to the father of lies. And this is actually what we see in Scripture. A lot of people are calling for unity, but at what cost? See, we're not meant to unify truth and lies. We're not meant to unify uh, uh, light and darkness. These things are meant to be separate. Jesus himself, many people are, are preach, uh, believe and preach a Jesus that is some sort of fantasy, nice guy. He's the sweetest freaking Ned Flanders you've ever heard of. And that's not the real Jesus. It's not the Jesus of the Bible. It's not the Jesus of Revelation 2 and 3, who speaks to the seven churches with a sword of fire coming out of his mouth. That's the real Jesus. And this watered-down, namby-pamby, pansy version of Jesus is fake, it's false, and it's a lie from the pit of hell. Here's some words from the real Jesus. In Luke chapter 12, I'm going to read verse 49 and on. I have come to bring fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo and what constraint I am under until it is completed. Do you think I came to bring peace on the earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two, two against three. They will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Jesus was not that namby-pamby Ned Flanders, let's all get along, kumbaya, guru, new age BS. That's not Jesus. And you are probably being lied to if you went to some sort of church where they preach that kind of version, that kind of false Jesus to you. I was thinking about earlier today, and I'll come back to this topic of of unity in a minute, but I was thinking earlier today uh, how often we've talked about the church being like a hospital, a place where people come in and get healed and healthy and emotionally healthy and, you know, recovering and binding up the brokenhearted. And there's a truth, there's a measure of truth to all of that within a larger context. 
See, I, I believe that there's many metaphors for the church. The church is the new Jerusalem. It's the bride of Christ. It's it's his covenant partner. There, there's uh, We are the sons of God. We are also the bride. Like There's lots of metaphors for the church. But one that I think we miss, especially in our modern context, is that we are soldiers. We are considered soldiers and ambassadors. Paul talks about this. He, he calls different people a fellow soldier. He talks about us being like soldiers and not being tangled up in the world's concerns because we're focused on the concerns of the kingdom and impacting the world from the kingdom. So there's a place of soldiers. And I think that one of the things that gets missed is that the church, in a lot of ways, is heaven's military base on the earth. It's literally the command outpost where the ambassadors come from as citizens of heaven into the earth. It is a place of training. It is a place of authority. It is a place of, of building and structuring and weaponizing and, and building the saints. Saints that can impact the world through the supernatural, as well as through the political, as well as through empowering people as well as through healing people uh, through the financial realm. There's so many different ways. Now, a military base would also have a medical tent off to the side where if you're injured, you need to get healed. Yes, of course, you're going to get injured in this process of battle and living life in this earth. And yet, most of us, we've, we've come from a church background. I'll say I, I've seen it countless times where we've, we're have we not even treating the church like a hospital. We're almost treating the church more like a hospice. Hey, I know you're broken. I'm broken too. We're going to be broken together. We'll probably be broken until the rest of our life, until we die. We don't really believe in restoration. We don't really believe in our true identity or that we're going to get healthy. You know, we're just going to kind of limp along. And, you know, the best thing I could do is probably make you comfortable until the day you know, you get raptured or or you die or something. It, see, the church is not a hospice and we're not a hospital. That's not our primary call. It's really not our primary call. Your primary call is a soldier, a son, a bride. Like those metaphors are much, much larger in scripture. And if you get hurt along the way, yes, deal with it. It's very important to deal with it, to get healthy and to focus on getting through so that you can get back into the fight. Now, if he's saying here, Jesus has come to cause division, not just, hey, you know, division might happen. No, I came to bring division. Oh my. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. Jesus Christ himself couldn't unify everybody. He literally divides everybody. So to have this idea that we're going to unify everybody, first we have to divide. And that's that's an important topic. Now I, I want to um I want to say here, you know, even when we start thinking about the dividing line, we start looking at the metaphors. Jesus talks in terms of wheat and tares. You get divided. Are you wheat or are you tares? The parable of the four soils. Which soil are you? Where's the seed landing? Are you one of these four soils? Even among the good soil, you could still be 30, 60, or 100 fold return. So there's a difference there. Even among the uh, uh, metaphors of the sheep and the wolves, or I send you out as, as doves among wolves, as sheep among wolves, but he talks about being a dove and the serpent, and those are two different dynamics as well. There's all these divisions in the Gospels. Division is not a problem. A lot of people have been stuck on the idea of unity at all costs. They put unity as this massive idol above other things. You know what matters more than unity? Truth. Truth matters more than unity. Truth comes before unity. 
truth has to be established as a foundation on which unity can be put on top. So here's the thing. Uh, Jesus focused first on truth, then later unity can come. And I'll show you that. I will show you that in John 17. We'll get there in a few moments. But truth is the primary. You have to have truth and divide over truth versus lies before you unify. Now, a lot of people, they, especially when it comes to political parties, political discussions, they like to go back mentally to uh, Joshua chapter 5. And there's this famous story of Joshua coming across the, the angel, uh, the angel of the Lord, and how the angel of the Lord, he asks him, whose side are you on? And he says, I'm on the Lord's side. Now, the problem for most people is they, they then take that and say, well, the Lord is not on the Democrat side and he's not on the Republican side. The Lord is on his own side. And they, they kind of take this weird stance with this instead of understanding what's really going on. So let's look at this passage in Joshua chapter 5. We'll start in verse 13. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell down on the ground in reverence and said and asked of him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now, here's Joshua. He's the head of Israel. He's the top, top general guy. This is where he's at. He sees a man. Doesn't say he sees an angel. He sees a man with a sword drawn. And he's like, okay, whose side are you on? Are you for us or for our enemies? He doesn't say, are you an angel? Are you a cherubim? Are you a seraphim? No, he sees a man with a sword drawn and he's saying, whoa, okay, are you for us or are you an enemy? Neither, but as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence. So here's what happens. Joshua is number one in this moment. He's the general head of Israel. He's the commander in chief. And here's some random dude with a sword pulled out. And he says, whoa, whose team are you on? And he says, uh, I'm actually the commander of the Lord's army. So as soon as that statement is made, Joshua now falls on his face and he is now submitting. What's happening here is a shift where he's now aware, oh, I'm under you. I'm coming on your side, not are you on my side? Are you on my side or the enemy's side? That's his question. And the retort brings Joshua to understand, oh, you're over me. I'm coming onto your side. I'm submitting to your side. Now, there's still the other side. There's still the other side the, the people of Jericho who have not come in alignment under the commander of the Lord's side. So the commander of the Lord, he's on one side with the Lord. And Joshua comes into alignment with that. Now they're on the same side. That's how that works. That's when you align with the Lord, when you stand on the side of his side or the side of truth, you're now aligned and unified on his side, and there's still another side. So this is what's happening here. So you have this, this thing of people take that to say, well, you know, the Lord's not on either side. No, as soon as Joshua fell down and was aligning himself, he's on the Lord's side, and the Lord's on Joshua's side, and there's alignment. So there is two sides. That's important to understand. Now, I said this at the beginning, we divide, then we unite. But what do we divide over? See, the dividing factor, Jesus said he came to bring division. Now, if he's bringing division, where is the dividing point? See, there's this amazing little passage where Jesus is talking with Pontius Pilate, 
And in John chapter 18, he says to him in verse 37, Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. See, Jesus was on the side of truth. And everyone who is on his side, who listens to him, is on the side of truth. If you have a side of truth, that means you have an up an opposite. And the opposite of truth is lies, falsehood, deception, manipulation. All of those things are on the other side. See, Jesus came as a son of the Father, the Father of truth. He came to testify of truth. He had a side of truth. And there's another side. In John chapter 8, when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, he says, your father is the father of lies. And they're like, our father is Abraham. And he says, no, your father is the devil. Your father is Satan. There are two fathers. There's the father of light. There's the father of truth. There's the father of Jesus, God the Father. And on the other side, there is the father of lies, Beelzebub, the devil, the evil one, Satan. He exists. He does things. He's working through the systems by lying and manipulating and deceiving people. And he's been doing it for thousands of years. And one of the greatest deceptions is what C.S. Lewis said, is that he gets you to believe he doesn't exist. Oh, my friend, he surely does exist. The 325,000 children that have been missing from being trafficked across the border of Mexico into the United States who have disappeared into slavery and human trafficking and sex slavery, that is a work of the devil. First John says that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And if you don't believe in the devil, then he's already got his hooks in you. He's already got a hold of your brain so bad in your theology that you're probably kind of useless, kind of a useless believer. And there's a lot of useless believers that don't believe in the devil, don't believe in hell, don't believe in the demonic, and yet How will you participate in being on the side of truth and battling against the demonic hordes and their lies and what they're doing to our world? See, you were put here to be salt and light. Salt preserves against decay. And Jesus says, if the salt loses its saltiness, it's worthless. It's to be thrown out on the ground and trampled upon. Your salt is actually meant to have an effect in this world. And it can't if you don't even believe that that your salt is supposed to do something because you don't even believe there's evil. You don't even believe there's an evil one. All right. That's part of my soapbox. Let's step back here and look at one last passage. This is uh, John chapter 17, where Jesus is praying for his disciples and he prays for unity. And this is what people typically go to when they think of how important unity that Jesus prayed that we would be one, even as he and the Father were one. Absolutely. That's beautiful. It's amazing. But before we get to that, we have to read it in context. I know, I know, not everybody likes to read things in context, but it is so valuable. So we're going to back up. We're going to start in John chapter 17, verse 13. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them... I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. 
My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also that those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now, there's so much that he just said. Let's pick it apart. First of all, he talks about being divided from the world, that there's the world and that they're not a part of it. And Jesus was not a part of it and they're not a part of it, but he sends them into it. So we're to be divided from the world, but not divided out of the world. You're actually to po- to go into it and make a difference, but you're not to be of it of it in the sense of enculturated and controlled and dominated and run and propagandized and ruled by the world, but you go and you participate by bringing the kingdom into the world. So there's a division between us and the world. The second piece, he says, is that there's an evil one. He says in verse 15, but that you protect them from the evil one. There is an evil one and that you are to be protected from it. That's another division. He also talks about, I have given them your word and the world has hated them. And then he tells us down here, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. So what did Jesus give us? He gave us his word. And what is his word? His word is truth. His word is truth. And those who don't have his word don't have the truth. They are in deception from the evil one. So that's our two realities on this planet. You can have his word and be sanctified, which is to be set apart, which is another division. You can be sanctified or unsanctified. You can be of the world or not of the world. You can be of the evil one or you can be of the father Jesus is praying to. These are all divisions. You can be of the lies or you can be set apart with the word, which is truth. So all of these divisions happen first. Then Jesus prays for unity. See, you have to be separated from the world. You have to be separated from the evil one. You have to be separated from lies. You have to be separated from all of those things and sanctified then unity, then unity. We don't unify the wheats and the tares. We don't unify the lies and the truth. We don't unify the evil one with the father of light. We don't unify these things. We first sanctify, then unify. We divide then we unite. We gather around truth, then we unify. This is the truth of Scripture. This is what we have to do. I believe that what we have seen over the last four years, everything we've been through over the last four years, has brought so much truth. It's brought so much truth to the surface. It's have people wake up to what's going on inside of our our chemicals in our food and protesting Kellogg's and and uh, protesting against the the vaccines and all the all the things that we've woken up to over the last four years has been dividing over truth. And it's created a place of those who've divided to the side of truth and those who continue to be manipulated and gaslit and lied to and controlled by the evil system of this world that is meant to disempower and control and is run by the evil one. But the side of truth, Jesus said, those who are on the side of truth, listen to him, that that side, that side of truth has so much unity to it. It's not about whether you're male, female, white, black, whatever. I I literally, I was at a J.D. Vance uh, rally about a week or two ago. um, And I saw, I saw a man with a, with a cowboy hat, sequin, 
cowboy hat, American flag on it, you know, American flag over his shoulders. Um, I don't know what gender this person would say they were. He was African American, uh, born male, but had a wig on, had makeup on. This was a transvestite at the JD Vance rally who was unified at least around the side of, I want freedom, I want truth. And yet he's still, whatever he is working through in his emotional life and his hurts and his challenges that he has to work through. But, oh my goodness, this this is wild. The amount of diversity among this side of those who are standing for truth, those who are standing for personal freedom, personal responsibility, small government, bringing the kingdom of God into the earth, that that side has moved this direction and we're unifying around things. Now, inside of that, you might say, oh, well, you know, but they don't know Jesus. They don't yet necessarily. And I'm not just talking about this one individual. I, I If you go back Tucker Carlson was not where he was now a year ago. He just shared a story just this week of how he grew up as a believer in a very generic sense, and that about a year ago, he had a demon come into his bedroom and physically attack him in the middle of the night, and he kept hearing in his spirit, you need to cry out to Jesus. And when he cried out to Jesus, the attack stopped immediately. And it was a massive wake-up call for him to step into true belief in Jesus. See, when you stand on the side of truth, you do hear him. That's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus said to Pilate in John 18, 37. Those who are on the side of truth, listen to me. I think eventually when you're on the side of truth, you start to hear the voice of Jesus. When When Donald Trump is obeying God in a very generic sense to run for president, But then a bullet whizzes through his ear. He then steps much closer to the reality of Jesus and his kingdom and divine protection. Russell Brand has been on the side of truth for a few years, speaking and boldly speaking the truth. And then he stepped over the line into, I want to accept Jesus as personal Lord, Savior, be water baptized and be a true believer. Jordan Peterson has been on the side of truth for years, preaching about truth for years in his lectures, and his wife gets cancer, and she starts having supernatural encounters with God, and he begins to have his own encounters with God, and Michaela begins to have encounters with God. This is how this works. You get on the side of truth, and you're going to find Jesus because he lives on the side of truth. You get on the side of truth and we will unify because you have to sanctify before you unify. Thank you for joining me this evening and uh, please share this. Uh, let, let's get this around. People need to hear this message. I appreciate you for watching. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Your wife has given you the slap. She says, I'm not in love with you anymore. You're a narcissist. Or she's in love with someone else and it's time for you to get out. As you sit alone in a cheap hotel room and are scrolling on Facebook, you see an ad for the bulletproof husband. You watch the intro video and book a free call with a bulletproof coach. After a really encouraging and relatable call with the coach, you take the leap and sign up. Immediately, you're in a new world of discovery. You're put into a group of guys who are in the exact same situation in their marriage. There are group coaches which guide you through the materials and the early stages of stabilization. You start to feel hope rising as the video trainings give you a clear and simple path for how to get your balls back and become the man, father, and husband you've always wanted to be. As you need more help, you now have options for a check-in call with a personal coach and a consultation with a professional coach for doing deep emotional work. You can even get a marriage and masculinity coach to work with you one-on-one. Once you master the first stages of growth, you advance to the next stage, where you'll learn the tools to rebuild trust inside your relationship, as well as how to use the seven-step apology, which is a powerful tool for cleaning up the past and healing your marriage. 
Once you've restored trust, you'll be ready to advance to the next stage where you'll learn how to be romantic, connected, and win her heart again. Your confidence and bravado will be soaring again like when you first met her. Once you win over her heart, you'll be at the beginning of a totally new relationship. You'll move into one more stage that'll teach you how to lead the relationship and how to create a high-powered life and marriage. You'll learn in this final stage how to master being bulletproof. Once you're bulletproof, you have the opportunity to help men that are going through the journey you went through. You can be of service and make a difference for thousands of other men, and by extension, their wives and children. Most men's programs like this are between $5,000 and $25,000, which makes sense considering the average divorce costs $35,000. And just one hour with a divorce lawyer will cost you $500. Yet we're motivated by one thing. We do this program so that children don't have to suffer the pain of a broken home. That's why our price is so stupidly low. The Bulletproof Husband Program I just described to you is only $297 a month. There's no minimum commitment. Come in, be transformed, heal your family, and cancel anytime. If you're ready to change and heal your marriage, go to bulletproofdocjohn.com.